Blinkers, an audio excerpt from the play by Coben Asetchi. First, a brief introduction by director Aisha Casely Hayford. This is an excerpt from Act 4 of The Blinkers, a multilingual play written in 1915 by Coben Asetchi. It is set in Ghana, or as it was called at the time of the play, the Gold Coast. The play deals with a real-life issue, that being which should take precedence between the Gold Coast 1884 marriage ordinance, which was implemented by the British, or the people of the Gold Coast's own traditional customs on marriage and succession. The 1884 marriage ordinance legalises and recognises a European-style marriage in Ghana. By that I mean the celebration of the union of a man and woman on receiving a certificate from a registrar or a licensed place of worship by an authorised minister. It has been argued that the marriage ordinance was formulated to address the needs of the European people in the African colonies. It became the parent of marriage laws throughout Commonwealth Africa. It remains in force beyond Ghana's independence in 1957. Sechi explores the friction between the 1884 marriage ordinance and traditional custom and practice. Through his considerations, the play also deals with the topic of colonialism and presents an argument for the intention of colonial powers to influence social behaviours in Ghana through the implementation of a device such as the 1884 marriage ordinance. In Act 4, we meet Mr. Brofusem. Brofusem translates from Fanti as one who wants their manner to be foreign, particularly British. Mr. Brofusem is joined by two local fishermen who enter Mr. Brofusem's home in disarray following an unseen comical accident that took place on the road outside just before. Mr. Brofusem calls out in Fanti to his houseboy, asking the houseboy to bring a clothes brush to assist the fishermen in cleaning themselves up. Once settled, the local fishermen, who are dressed in European-style clothes, challenge Mr. Brofusem's opinion on a recent legal case concerning the marriage ordinance of 1884, and also Mr. Brofusem's movement away in appearance and in thought from the European standards previously heralded. Mr. Brofusem asserts his position. He explains how the 1884 marriage ordinance cannot overturn or invalidate native customary laws in Ghana and that his own movement away from European ways is simply common sense. Through the characters' discussions, we see Sechi's mocking of locals who pursue European ways and we hear Sechi's moral message of returning to the ways of the ancestors and letting each race keep their own ways to themselves. Sechi makes strong caricatures of some of his characters, which can seem uncomfortable, but it's part of the message he's trying to share. He wants his local audience to laugh at themselves, and he wants to expose the traits that he himself was highly critical of at the time. This excerpt is full of humour and energy, and is a great summary of what occurred earlier on in the play. I hope it inspires you to read the play in full, if you haven't done so already. Happy Africa man, original. Happy Africa man, original. Please sit down somewhere. Namichi, for bros, now was it proper? I get wound for my elbow. I knock my corn on the stone and my head on the telegraph post. You fall down. I only knock the telegraph post. But did you not hear the lorry coming? No. I hear a wonderful noise and I think it is a cow. I do not know that lorry make noise like cow. Then we hear lorry noise and people say, look out. Then we jump and I knock the telegraph post and he fall down. Hey, Mr. Professor, you wear cloth. Just what I almost said. Yes. Why shouldn't I wear cloth? No. You have educated in England. You disgrace yourself if you wear cloth. Oh, I see. You are following lawyer on Yimsy now. Yes, just what I almost said. You say I'm following on Yimsy. Of course I am. He has more brains than I. But you say long time that he is a fool because he wears cloth. Yes, you say it to me too. It, 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 I, I was the fool at the time. Funny. You wear sandals too. 
Yes, standards. Why to... not? My poor toes were tortured under the old regime of boots. They are happier now in sandals under the rule of common sense. Mm, but you are not going out in cloth. Not outside. I don't see any reason why I shouldn't. I, I even wish I could go barefoot. But the soles of my feet are so confoundedly tender now. The bushman, as we call him, is a better man than I in that respect. Mm, strange. Strange. But I hope you don't like the case lawyer on Yim's day win the other day. It means that all our wives married in chapel are not lawfully married. Yeah. Hello. I, I, I never thought of that. I shall consult on Yim's on the point. Ah. But it isn't so. I got engaged to my wife in the manner prescribed by our custom. And I too. And I too. So you see, everything is all right. Oyemzi's plea in defending Miss Chiba was that the marriage ordinance of 1884 had nothing to do with her. And that is what I can't able to understand. I too. The reason is just this. That the ordinance applies to those already married under the native law who later desire to become full members of some church or other. So, all of us who married in churches are really married under the native law. But you cannot marry more than one wife when you go to chapel. Yes, you cannot. The native law in its own way recognizes only one wife. That is the first wife. Any other wives that may be afterwards married are minor wives, subordinate to the first wife. If they belong to respectable families, not one of such minor wives will be given in marriage to the man who wants a wife or more besides his first wife. Unless that first wife herself goes with the man's women folk to ask for her. That I never know. And I too. That used to be the rule when the native state was absolute in his power to deal with the members thereof according to their deserts and before undigested and indigestible foreign ideas began to eat into the vitals of the native social system. In the old days, when sons succeeded to the ancestral stools, the sons of the first wife had precedence, irrespective of age. Is that so? Hmm? What are you doing? We want ham club. I don't want to talk of marriage. Ham club? No thanks. <laughs> Once I would have jumped at it. I'm a good deal more rational now. Fatty meats are not good for us out here, you know. So you are lawyer on him, this disciple now. You imitate him? No, I do not imitate him. We both view things from the same standpoint. Now, I admit, he put me into the way of reaching that standpoint. All right. Let us finish to speak of the case. And Guanan can speak of his ham club afterwards. Yes. Onyemzi proved that the girl was not engaged to Akadu at all because there were no witnesses to the engagement. But they went to chapel. Yes. Chapel. That made no difference. You see, the proper witnesses to an engagement under the native law are certain relatives of both parties and not the parties themselves. No such relatives could come forward as witnesses of the engagement that was said to have taken place at the garden party at Victoria Park some months ago. But the person joined their hands and they signed their name in the book in the vestry. Yes, I saw them in the vestry. You are not following. I say that Onyemzi proved that the marriage ordinance of 1884 was for those already married under native law who later conceived the idea of becoming full members of a church. Miss Tiba was not engaged to Okadu according to custom. She could not, therefore, be married to Okadu under the native law. Yes, but my friends say they went to chapel. I saw them myself. Now, let us talk of ham club. Then we can also get fresh meat from the steamer. And ice, fresh milk... And our pet. Ushre, I'm gonna shut your mouth. Let us finish this talk first. So, Mr. Bofferson, Miss Siba was not engaged. No. Only MC showed that under native law, an engagement was really a marriage. The only difference being that the bride had not commenced to live with her husband. Pipes, tobacco, and some money had to be sent to relatives and very intimate friends by the bride's people after the bridegroom had sent clothing, etc., to the bride, before the latter could be conducted with torches to the former's house at night on a day appointed by himself for the reception of his bride. 
The bride simply had no business to be in her husband's house till after the first night when everybody who is anybody knew that the bride had been taken to her husband's house and not gone there by herself. You, you can see how strict the old people were when you consider this uh, taking of the bride to the bridegroom at night and not before on the day appointed. Mm, let's talk of fresh meat. Ah, now I can smoke. The girl's child was born dead. Not so? Yes, and Okadu had to pay Aifa. Why? He engaged the girl? Not so? If he had got engaged to her in a proper way, he would not have had to pay Aifa because in that case, he would have wronged himself, you see? Under the native law, the man to whom a girl is engaged has the right to claim and receive Aifa if anybody tampers with the girl. If he himself is the culprit, he has to claim Aifa from himself, which is absurd. But then, he forfeits the right to send the girl away in the morning after the first night. The right of a man who finds that his bride is not virtuous. On the other hand, the bride cannot be accorded the honors of the virtuous bride, nor does she pass through the real wedding ceremony, which in the old days took place eight days after the first night. We of these so-called enlightened days know little or nothing of these grand old customs. We when are we going to talk of the harm claw? <coughs> <coughs> Hello? What's the matter? What's the matter? What's up? I forget myself. I try to swallow the smoke and make it come out my nose like cigarette. Let me slap your back. No! Your hand is too big. You'll soon be alright. Don't cough so sharply. I can't. Moro! All right, now, what do you say? You say my hand too big? Yes. You come from Bush and you go to school here. You get Bushman hands. You drunk. You drink more whiskey than me. Mr. Professor, what about the ham club? Also, the fresh meat. Fresh meat, ice, apple. I don't want them. The meat, as a matter of fact, cannot be fresher than that sold here in town. If decent cattle were killed instead of bony ones, the meat here would be better than any you could buy from the boats. Ah, but that is the native meat. Uh, fresh meat from the steamer is European meat. It must be nice. Huh? He talks like fisherman. I tell him about eating on steamer and he wants some. He never ate on steamer before. You drunk! You too! Now, now, gentlemen, please, shake hands and forget all about it. Uh, let us talk of something else now. No. I am going. I will not talk of this fisherman. He smells of fish. I too. I will go. I will not stop here where this bushman has sit down. He smells of fish. Well, I'm blessed. Really, Onion Z was right all along the line. If only we were national. We should be more rational and infinitely more respectable. Our ways and our things suit our climate. <laughs> For one thing, our drinks have not the same maddening effect on our people as European drinks have. The people of the old days were wise indeed. <sighs> If only we would follow the customs they left us a little more and adopt the ways of other races a little less, we should be at least as healthy as they were. Happy Africa man, original. Happy Africa man, original. I don't be gentle, man, at all, at all. I don't be gentle, man, at all, no. I be Africa, man, original. I don't be gentle, man, at all, no. I be Africa, man, original. I don't be gentle, man, at all, no. Oh, da 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 da
That was The Blinkards, an audio excerpt from the play by Cobbina Secchi. Mr. Barofasem was played by Cobbner Holbrook-Smith, the first man by David Ajao, and the second man by Tunji Lucas. The director was Aisha Casey-Hayford, 